Good evening. Welcome to Tomorrow Matters, a channel that focuses on technology and futurology looked at through the lens of environmentalism, philosophy, and rational thought. Here, we explore emerging technologies, existential questions, and challenges to our planet and the beings who live on it. Today's topic is a heavy one. We're going to go deep into transhumanism, a subject that might make some people uncomfortable, excited, or a mix of both. I'm still deciding where I stand on that line, but I can assure you that researching this topic gives plenty to think about. Transhumanism, briefly explained, means the modification of human beings through technology and engineering. It employs a variety of methods used to cure ailments or upgrading humans just for the sake of it, creating people that are smarter, stronger, healthier, or more productive. This is an idea that is prevalent in science fiction, where we see plenty of cyborgs and people with genetic modifications or implants that increase their abilities. But today, many companies and organizations are creating these technologies. In the future, they could become perfected and widely available to the market. Today, we will discuss several of these technological and medical advancements, as well as focus on the philosophical implications of transhumanism, eternal life, and the meaning of what it means to be human. So buckle up your seatbelts, because this is going to be an amazing ride. Like many things, transhumanism comes in several presentations. They could be considered different approaches to reach the same goal, which is improving human beings through technology. Most of these methods can be combined with each other, and they are not limited to the human body. Homo Deus, written by Yuval Noah Harari, describes the specific ways in which human beings will adopt transhumanism. It is my favorite book, because it goes deep into the topic, analyzing how human values have shaped technology in the past, and at the same time it has modified our own values. It is a fantastic read that I highly recommend to anybody who's interested in the philosophy of the future. In the book, Harari focuses on three main paths, biological engineering, cyborg engineering, and the engineering of non-organic beings. Each one has its own implications, as well as ethical and social challenges. I'll start by giving several examples of how these technologies can and will be applied. Engineering humans on the biological level involves technologies related to gene editing. The most popular example is CRISPR, which is already offering promising results in the farming and medicine industries. According to an article from PNAS, scientists are already working with the FDA for development and marketability of CRISPR. They describe that, the Food and Drug Administration's Center for Veterinary Medicine has long recognized and supports the potential of genome editing in animals to deliver transformative solutions to challenges in both human and veterinary medicine, agricultural, and more. This technology consists in modifying specific parts of an organism's genetic code to reach specific goals like make a fruit larger, eliminate diseases, or make the body stronger against them. By going into the genetic code, we can add, modify, or remove genotypes. The application of CRISPR and similar technologies in humans are already being used to cure hereditary and genetic diseases. This will have positive effects, making future generations healthier, but it also comes with its own implications and things to consider. A possibility is that people will go a step further, editing genes to create better looking, stronger, and longer living human beings. Other implications include physically modifying organs or things such as the immune system to our will. One can imagine the consequences of this, where essentially a new species of upgraded human beings is created. The second method involves the modification of human beings through machines that connect to bodies. Some examples of this include prosthetic limbs, artificial organs, and brain-computer interfaces, or BCIs. Not all cyborgs look like in science fiction movies. If you have a replacement hip, pacemaker, or any medical device that involves a foreign machine, that it could be considered a transhumanist cyborg implant. It simply involves the idea of using devices to repair or improve oneself. However, cyborg engineering is not limited to prosthetics or medical devices. By far, the most incredible current topic related to this method involves BCIs. These technologies are in their infancy, but I think they will become the next major disruption when it comes to human inventions, on par with the creation of electricity and the internet. They are a vast topic that merit a video of their own, to go deep into the ethics, philosophy, and sociopolitical implications of these devices. A BCI is a small device that is surgically attached to the brain. By using and training neural pathways as inputs, the device receives signals from the user, which are translated into commands for the device's computer. It can connect to the internet, and essentially functions as a brain-implanted smartphone. The most popular company currently developing BCIs is Elon Musk's Neuralink, whose prototypes have successfully managed to make a monkey play a game of Pong against the computer, solely by using brain waves. In this video, we can see the monkey training the Neuralink by rewarding positive behavior. Every time the monkey scores a point, he receives a banana smoothie shot as a reward. The brain movements are recorded by the Neuralink as information, and when the monkey repeats the same brain activity, the computer receives that input. BCIs will start as a way to help patients with neurological diseases like Parkinson's, where there will come a time where they will supersede the smartphone as a personal device. As they improve, we will be able to send emails, play video games, write papers, and even photograph only by using our thoughts. 
Other technologies are only limited by our own imaginations. We could have robotic limbs controlled remotely by our brains, upgraded immune systems involving bloodstream nanobots, and even willfully replace our eyes to have stronger vision. This is an equally exciting and concerning future, but we will look more at those effects later. The third and final method does not involve the human body at all, but instead opts for using external machines as mediums for our goals. By combining robotics with artificial intelligence and our conscious brain activity, we could essentially expand ourselves indefinitely through engineering. With things like cloud computing and mind uploading, which deserve full videos of their own, AI could also be seen as a way of improving our goals, therefore being an extension of humanity. This might sound like science fiction, but the basis for reaching this point are already being laid down. Think of your smartphone right now. What is it? What does it do? It is a device that holds a part of you, no matter how strange that might sound. We use our smartphones and computers as external containers for our information and goals, allowing us to do things no human could do a hundred years ago. This goes back to the idea of BCIs. Why go through the tedium of going through your phone to show somebody a picture when you could just think of it and make it pop instantly? Or taking your phone out to send a message when you could just do it through your brain in half a second? These activities are confined to the computer today, but tomorrow the line between ourselves and technology will blur. But why go through these modifications? Well, the initial motivations behind transhumanism are not only benign, but morally desirable. The answer, even subconsciously, might just have to do with humanity's desire to want to cheat death and improve our health. Combating and curing diseases and restoring mobility and lost limbs could be considered a form of proto-transhumanism, but we need philosophers to analyze the ethics for going to the next level. The desire for eternal life is something humans have strived for for centuries. When discussing eternal life, I usually ask people a series of questions. First, would you like to live indefinitely? And, if you have the chance, would you like to live 200 years? What about 120? I personally am surprised at the answers. Many of those who I ask think that being amortal or having an indefinite lifespan discarding accidental death would be a nightmare. A common belief is that over time, life would lose its purpose without death, or it would get too boring. However, no one in their right mind would say the same thing about life expectancy 200 years ago. In Europe during the 1970s, the life expectancy was around 36 years old. Someone today saying that they would not want to live past 40 because that would be too much would sound ridiculous. If they say they didn't want their loved ones to live past that age, they would be considered psychopaths. There seems to be a change in perception once people actually reach that age instead of just contemplating it. Another argument I've heard is that they wouldn't like to live past 100 because they would not enjoy being old. What would be the point, they say, to live that long if you wouldn't have the energy or health to do with the things you love? But what if you could reach this age or more while still looking 50 or 60? Is this even possible? In their book Lifespan, authors David Sinclair and Matthew Laplante argue that old age is a disease and can be treated as one. They go deep into the science of how aging works, how to live longer, look healthier, and insane scientific developments that could make aging and death a thing of the past. Briefly explained, the authors describe that the effects of aging are caused by loss of information each time the cells are regenerated and replaced through their years. If scientists can figure out how to delay or even stop this loss of information, we could hold in our hands the key to understanding and ending old age. In the future, we will be looking at lifespans that go beyond 100 years. The first people who reach 150, 200, or even 300 years of life might be living among us. The truth is that no matter how much one would think that living hundreds of years is too much or an undesirable thing, no one would reasonably say the same for their loved ones. No one would wish that their mother or best friend would live to a certain age before they died, because their life went too long already. The truth is that extending our lifespans as much as possible is a morally desirable goal. The reason that many of this sounds like a crazy idea is that we are not used to the idea of living too long. However, ideas and people change with time. For future generations, it will seem tragic that most of us did not get the chance to experience the beauty of life beyond 80 years of age. So let's end this by asking the same question again. If you had the chance to live a few more years beyond 90, while looking young and healthy, would you take it? How about a few decades? Centuries? How about spending that much time with the people you love? Would you take that chance? I certainly would. After everything we just discussed, one might think either one of two things, that allowing a part of our species to essentially upgrade themselves is beneficial towards humanity, or that it is a terrible idea that goes against nature and ethics and should be avoided at all costs. The positive side of the discussion argues that humans have already adopted transhumanism through medicine. By healing ourselves when we are sick, operating when we break an arm, or suffer from cancer, we are already breaking the laws of nature. Saying that transhumanism is unnatural, therefore it is bad, is an appeal to nature fallacy that is inconsistent with the ideas behind medicine. Elon Musk claims that by improving ourselves, human beings have a chance to be on par with the inevitable AI revolution, which is the argument that led him to create Neuralink. Another organization that supports transhumanism is Humanity Plus, which advocates for the ethical implementation of these technologies through evidence-based science and widespread philosophical discussion. There is also a strong case for the regulation and cautious implementation of transhumanism. A future where a percentage of the population is better than the rest comes with plenty of problems. The future will be automated by AI, which will already lead to a disparity in wealth and by keeping people without jobs. 
This problem will worsen, as people who have limited access to these technologies won't keep up with the rapid changes. This rift in capability will lead to future problems such as a further divide of the economic inequality, where people who are not transhumanists will suffer from discrimination, less opportunities, and difficulty adapting to a world shaped and molding by the ruling, technologically advanced class. We have to be mindful of every argument in order to reach valuable philosophical discussions. My own opinion is a mix of both sides. My personal view is that adopting transhumanism should be free for anybody who wants it. I also believe that these technologies should be funded and encouraged. They should also be regulated, based on laws that prioritize factual evidence and ethical implementation. This is a reason why lawmakers with strong scientific and philosophical backgrounds should have a bigger role in our governments. Because these questions will only become more complicated as the decades go by and these technologies increase in quality and influence. The implications and widespread effects of transhumanism are hard to identify, as these technologies are too early in development to be certain of the effects they will have. So what do you think? Is transhumanism an inevitable thing? Would you modify your brain or body to become better, faster, or stronger? Does this idea make you uneasy, or does it inspire you? Let me know in the comments, I would love to discuss this. If you enjoyed this video, please check out the others and stay tuned for weekly dives into existential topics such as this one. I'm thinking of starting a series where I discuss different transhumanist technologies each month, where I go deep into the topic while providing contemporary examples. Please follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok for more of this content, and if you want to learn more about transhumanism, I'll put different sources and videos in the description. This was everything for today, thank you for watching Tomorrow Matters, and I'll see you soon.